Holy Triune God, thank you so much for this time, for us as believers, for us as saints, as one family under you, to gather together. Lord, we consecrate this time to you, and we ask that your Holy Spirit will speak every word that I may misspeak, Lord, every, every flaw in what is that I will say today, Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit will make up, and so much more. We ask that you will help each and every one of us to understand your word today. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. What, what is the story of, in this case, for many of us, an Asian American? What's the story behind that? Like many of you, parents, you may have been born and raised in a different country, and then came to America for further education and to pursue a secure, secure future. But also, like many of us, young people, you were born and raised here in America. And so many times you've heard your family and your parents tell you to, you know, do good in school, right? To do good in these extracurricular activities so that one day you may also be able to go to a good college, get a good job, and also have a stable future. But imagine yourself that after doing all of these things, after so much sacrifice on the parents' part, after so much hard work and discipline, on the youth's part, to find out that as you start to apply for college, you've been rejected. <laughs> but not because your grades weren't good enough, not because you didn't do enough extracurricular activities or enough internships. No, it's actually something a lot more basic than that. Imagine that you were rejected from college simply because you are Asian. Now, for many, many families and students who applied to Harvard, that was their proposal. <laughs> that they brought a lawsuit against Harvard just recently, within this year, that the case is still going on. They brought a lawsuit against Harvard, saying that, again, their proposal was that Harvard <laughs> was discriminating Asian Americans and making the threshold for them a lot higher than the other minority groups. Again, the decision for this case has not been reached. The judge is still working through all the facts and what was presented to reach a verdict. However, this type of reality was being felt by many Asian Americans very recently. Now, this is one of many stories in America. The Asian American experience, just one of many. Think about it like this. What about the African American or the Native American story, where they're fighting so hard to get equal recognition within society and within the laws. Not only that, but what about many Hispanics today? What's their story? Well, also, they're fighting so hard to even come to this country, stay in this country. I know, for example, my wife's, my wife's family and so many people she knows are fighting so hard to stay in this country. And so we see that the world we live in is filled with so many different types of stories amongst so many different people. But I would challenge us to take a step back to look at all these different stories and ask ourselves, is there a common thread here? What is the commonality in all these stories? Because sometimes, believe it or not, when we start telling these different ethnic-specific stories, sometimes they can actually divide us more than unite us. Now, thanks be to God, that there is, this common thread that I speak of, has been recorded and preserved for us in God's Word. Now today we're going to look a little bit deeper as to what is that common thread amongst so many different stories today of people's lives and all different backgrounds, specifically when it comes to race and ethnicity. So please, if you have your Bibles, turn with me. Genesis 11. Genesis 11. Now today we find ourselves at the Tower of Babel. And to recap, this past couple weeks, Jeff and I have been going back and forth, trying to go through Genesis a little bit more, and trying to set up the stage of what is going on in the world we live in today. And so to recap, God, the Father, along with the Trinity, created the world to show the life-givingness that God has. And then he created 
humankind to be in a relationship with himself. But eventually, that humankind broke that relationship, broke that trust, and decided to do whatever they wanted to do. Now, because of that, there has been many, many problems between men and women, and because of that, the ground has been cursed. Growing food and surviving would be very, very difficult. And so these, this couple, we call them Adam and Eve, have been kicked out of the Garden of Eden to fend for themselves. But as this human population starts to grow more and more in number, not only are there more in number, but there's also so many more ways to express their autonomy, so many more ways to express their sin. And as all of this types of different sin starts to accumulate, starts to build up, God takes a look at the world and says, wow, humanity is evil at heart, even from the very beginning of their conception. And so because of that, God chooses a righteous family at the time, Noah's family. And he bring, God brings a flood to the whole world in a way you can say to cleanse it, to start over with Noah's family. And so we find ourselves today here with Noah's family. You can say the restart button. However, God also gave the same command to Noah's family that he gave to Adam and Eve. If we go back to chapter 9, verse 1, I'll read it for us real quick. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So this, this instruction was very, very similar to what God said to Adam and Eve. So it's almost as if God is, you can say, starting over. But now that God has started over with Noah's family, are they actually going to remain in relationship with God? Or, like their ancestors before them, are they going to follow their own path? So let's find out. Read with me here in verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. Let's pause there. The whole earth had one language and the same words. Kind of sounds repetitive, right? Kind of sounds redundant. Why is the writer saying kind of like the two, same thing two times? Why is he saying that? Here's an example for you. In America, generally, we say we speak English. It's the general recognized national language. However, if you go to the south part of America, and you go to a restaurant, you wouldn't be surprised your waiter who comes up to you and say, Good evening, y'all. How are y'all doing? What can I get y'all to drink? Can I get you a water or a soda? <laughs> and at first, it's confusing. I don't know about you, but whenever I've heard that in the south, I'm like, well, what's happening here? Are we in America? And so I really just think, like, wait, hold up. So they're still speaking English, right? General words, words, the sounds. It's still the same. But when they use their own specific words, such as yao instead of you guys, or soda as a generalization for a carbonated sugary beverage, then it's kind of it's confusing, right? Not only that, but how about this? What if you hit the streets of downtown Baltimore? I'm, I guarantee you, you can hear people speak in this manner as well. Hey, yo, what up? I haven't seen you in a minute. Holla at your boy, what's good? <laughs> right? And so with that being said, we, we can say that they're still speaking English. But their vocabulary and their language is slightly different. Now, of course, we would consider that to be a dialect of English in America. There's many. But generally speaking, the language is still the same, but the words are different. Now here in verse 1, that's not the case. Here in verse 1, humanity has the exact same language with the exact same words. There's no slang they don't understand. There's no dialect. That when Noah's family, after the flood, started to flourish, they literally had one language. They all spoke the same way. They all thought in the same manner as well. Showing that they truly have been unified in that sense. Now, if you haven't noticed, language and culture are interdependent. They're connected at the hip. If you have a different language, even if it's a dialect, your culture is going to be slightly different. And obviously, if you have totally different languages, it's going to be totally different cultures. Now, for example, I look at my own life, 
And I see that I'm more Hmong American, my ethnic, my race is Hmong, but when I look at my grandparents or my parents, they're, they identify with more being more Hmong. And so how this plays out, especially in the language, is that we have like a formal, informal way to speaking to our elders. And so when we, when we have this whole vocabulary to speak to our elders in a more respectful way, that is also played out in how we treat our elders. Meaning that, in other words, it's going to be more of a hierarchy relationship. Meaning that your elders are going to be at the top of the pyramid, whereas the younger people like us are going to be closer to the bottom of the pyramid in terms of respect, in terms of influence, and in terms of uh, if your opinion matters. And so whenever I, I go to my elderly uh, family, I would have to be a bit more using more respectful language, or uh, my mannerisms would have to be more respectful towards them. But of course, when I'm with my peers, it's just less formal. And so in the same way, we see here that language describes the culture, but the culture animates the language. So I would say it's the same here as well. Not only did Noah's descendants have the same words and language, they had the same culture. There was no cultural distinctions. Because if the words and language was the same, the thought processes will also be the same. And how that's lived out in the culture will reflect that. And so we see that at this point in, in humanity, they were truly united. They were truly one. There were no divisions. There was no separate stories of how people came to be and their struggles. No. There's only one. That was Noah's family. But now that humanity is one, how are they going to express this oneness? Again, are they going to listen to the Lord's instructions? Or are they going to create their own path? Let's see. What does humanity do in their unity? Continue with me in verse 2. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had bricks for stones and tar for mortar. So we see here that already Noah's family had decided to settle in the plain of Shinar. Now if you're settling somewhere, that means you're not moving, right? You're staying there in that one spot. But if we remember correctly, what did God instruct Noah's family to do? Yes, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Imagine it like this. It's like, it's like a little child who has grown up, you know, listening to their parents, you know, their instructions, telling them what to do. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, when they learn to talk, one of the first words they learn is, no, right? And so when the parents are like, hey, honey, can you throw this away? Hey, honey, can you pick up your stuff? No! You're just like, whoa, where did that come from? And so in the same way, that's the same here with Noah's family. After God has given them instructions, and I can just, I can just picture them walking. And Noah's family walking, oh man, okay, we've got to do what our ancestors told us to do, which was, you know, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, it hits them like a train. Wait a second. I don't need to. I don't need to listen. We don't need to listen to God. We don't need to go fill the earth. We can just stay here. In other words, they're saying, no, to God. And so with that being established, we can already see that Noah's descendants are already starting to veer off that relationship with God. But because of that, how do they respond to that? How... How, do they, how else do they express that level of rebellion? How else do they express that? Now I want to bring our attention to this. Whenever the Bible gives you specific, very specific details, you guys, we all need to pay attention to these specific details. All right? So in this case, the people have said no to God. They've in a way stood up to God, just like a little kid to their parents. And then what else do they do? Right here. Verse 3, and they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And, have, and they have bricks for stones and tar for mortar. Now, these are building materials, obviously, right? But at the same time, let me ask you this. When was the last time you were walking through the dense forests of Maryland and you're like, wow, it's a brick? Or, wow, it's a tar in its most natural habitat, right? <laughs> that doesn't happen, right? It doesn't happen. You don't find tar and brick 
lying around in the, in the forest of Maryland, or anywhere for that matter. Tar and brick are a creation of humanity. It takes, it takes, it takes wisdom to truly bring these chemicals, to bring these elements together, a certain uh, mm -hmm. mixture, a compound that you need to create in order to solidify it. So we see here already that Noah's descendants are being described as people who are very, very smart. Very, very wise. They weren't just some, you know, st some, uh, yeah, they weren't just some hominoids, they weren't just some Stone Age people. Right? No, they were smart. They, they knew what they were doing. But not only that, if that doesn't, if that doesn't testify to their wisdom, the fact that they have fire, right? Think about it. They're going to burn the bricks with fire. Think about fire. All of humanity, whichever civilizations have fire, they're the ones who rule. Because you think about what, what can we do with fire? We can cook our food. We can keep warm when it's cold. We can even use it for farming. If you guys ever heard of using fire to, uh, destroy, it, to, to destroy the plants, so they'll turn to ashes, they'll you know, become nutrients to the next coming generation of plants. Not only that, but in this case, to make building materials, bricks. So we see that Noah's descendants are so intelligent, almost to the level of modern day Elon Musk and Steve Jobs. Think about it like this, all right? So it's, it's like this. Elon, Elon Musk, right, he's like, you know, driving around town, and he's like, oh, that's, that's a nice car, right? Like, yeah, you know, you know, combustible engine, yeah, you know, it has like gasoline and like, you know, diesel and you know, you know, pistons and stuff. No. But guess what? Bam! Electric motor. You know, it's like, he looked at it and he made it something even better and everyone's like, wow, that guy's so smart. Steve Jobs, in the same, I, mean, I don't know how you guys feel about Apple or Microsoft, but regardless, Steve Jobs created a new operating system as well for computers. Now in the same way, this is exactly how Noah's descendants were. They're not, they're not only smart and intelligent, but when they looked at the, the world around them, they're like, oh, that's nice. You're trying to cook your meat. You're trying to cook your vegetables using the sun and this really hot rock. That's great. And they're like, bam, we got fire at will. We can cook all this at will. And so you think about it on this level, that this generation of Noah's family, they were very intelligent people. They were not just people who woke up one day, didn't know left from right, and decided to say no to God. No. They were conscious, intelligent beings who looked God in the face and said, no, we're not going to follow your instructions. And now that they have established their position to the Lord and in this world, how else do they express this level of rebellion to God? How else, how else are they going to show God, actually, we don't want to listen to you. This is how. Continue with me. Here in verse 4. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its tops in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. As we said earlier, Noah's descendants have chosen to settle, right? They've chosen to stay in one place. But not only do they settle, but they decide to build themselves a city. Now, I don't know if you guys ever thought about cities in this manner. But urban life, city life, essentially what it is saying is that I'm tired of being, I'm tired of wandering the earth. I'm tired of migrating from place to place, trying to survive, get food, get material, and all these things. Instead of doing that, let's just stay in one place. Let's just build here. And let's just build life here. So we don't need to wander anymore. In other words, Noah's descendants were saying, even though God has kicked out all of humanity outside the Garden of Eden, to be, to be left to wander and fend for themselves, even if that's the case. And even though God told them to go uh, fill the earth, Noah's descendants are like, no, we're going to stay here, and we're not going to wander the earth anymore. We're not going to trust and depend on God as our security and our rest anymore. We're going to create our own security. We're going to create our own rest, starting with the city. Now, brothers and sisters, this is just like us. How many times do we not want to depend on God as our rest and as our security? How many times do we just want to stop wandering the earth, stop wandering from one thing to another thing? When was the last time you thought that if you could just have a good enough education, if you could have a good enough job, your heart would be satisfied, that your problems would disappear? 
Or when was the last time that you thought that if you can just have this kind of boyfriend or girlfriend or spouse, that your heart could rest in peace? Your, bl your blood level will go down, and tension will be released from you. Or when was the last time that you thought you could find rest and peace, satisfaction, and having more stuff and having more money? In other words, we all are still trying to seek that rest. We all are still trying to seek that security, just like Noah's descendants. We're not that different after all. And not only that, but we see the true motivation for Noah's descendants building this city. Instead of finding rest and security in God, they build a city. In other words, they're trying to find their rest and security in themselves, in their own methodologies, in their own intellect, in their own creation, rather than what God has already provided for humanity. And a part of finding that rest in themselves was creating a tower. Now I know many of us might not, you know, build towers every day, but in, when it comes to Noah's family, building a tower, especially this type of tower, and this type of architecture, to summarize, this type of architecture kind of looked like a, step, a stepping stone pyramid. But the point of this architecture at this time was to truly build stepping stones, according to their mythology, to heaven. And as we see here in verse 4, it says, we want to build a tower that touches heaven. Because in other words, they wanted to communicate with the divine, with the gods themselves. But Noah's descendants do something even more insidious. Instead of building a tower to ask the gods to come down, Noah's descendants build a tower so that they can go up to heaven and interact and be gods. Now this is further verified when they say right here in verse 4, Now, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its tops in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be dispersed. Make a name for yourself. That building this city, building this tower, is not just for the sake of having buildings, but it's for the sake of having a name for yourself. But let's think about it. What does, having, what does making a name for yourself really mean? What does that actually mean? I'm sure we've heard it thrown around here and there. What does it really mean? Go make a name for yourself. Think of it like this. When I say the name, Michael Jordan, what do you guys think about? Shoes. Um. <laughs> Shoes, right? Or basketball, in other words. When I say the name Bach, what do you guys think about? Yeah. Music or composition. In other words, and in this case, yes, these people are famous, but, and even their name, right, even the drips, how famous they are. But, in this case, when Noah's descendants are saying, let's make a name for ourselves by building a city and a tower that touches heaven, it's more than about being famous. That making a name for yourself is truly about having your whole reputation, your whole legacy, being saturated and associated with a certain deed that was accomplished. And in this case, for Noah and his descendants, that certain key was to truly build the tower so that all people from all time would know, wow, these were Noah's descendants. That this tower was the epitome, it was the manifestation of their pride, of their wisdom, of their intellect. And they wanted their name and their reputation to represent exactly that. That every time you would hear about Noah's descendants, the first thing you would think about is, oh, they were powerful people. Something to be proud of. They were worthy human beings. Again and again, we see here that Noah's descendants are just saying no over and over again to the Lord God. They're truly trying to pave their own way to the Lord God. But now, they have established building a city, settling, building a tower to touch heavens with their intellect, in their unity as humanity, how is the Lord going to respond to all of this? What is God going to say to them? Is, is God going to, you know, be angry, come down from heaven and kick down the tower, and you know, start stomping around and destroying their places? Or is God going to, just like he did to the woman, to Eve, 
Is God going to ask them simple questions of what they were doing? Let's find out here in verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have one language. This is only the beginning of what they would do, and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. From a glance, it sounds like God is afraid of people. God is saying, whoa, 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 this is, if this is what they can do now, I can't imagine later on what they can do. It sounds like God is threatened by humanity. As if God is thinking, wow, if I don't stop this now, later on they're truly going to create something to overpower me. But let's take a pause here. Is God truly asking that? Is God truly implying that he's afraid of humanity? Don't forget where we are right now. This is af right after the flood. God has just finished flushing out the evilness from the world. He just finished doing that. And now, evilness is still there within human hearts. So is God really going to flush the world again? Well, of course not. He made the promise to Noah with the rainbow. He's not going to do it again. But is God going to do something that drastic to truly start over again? Because if this is just the beginning of what humanity was capable of doing, there's no telling where they're going to go from here. Instead, instead of God starting over again, like he did with Noah and his family, what does he say? What does he do instead? But to be clear, God is not afraid of humanity. God is not threatened by humanity. It's more of a feeling of sympathy towards humanity. In the sense saying that God thinking, I just finished flushing the world out. I just finished doing that. And yet, here we are again with humanity trying to create their own plans, their own ways, and their own world where they are the center of existence. It's not so much that God is afraid of humanity. It's more so that God is protecting humanity. It's more so that this is an act of mercy. That if God is going to intervene with humanity right now, it is an act of mercy. Because if humanity continues in this trajectory, if they continue in this path, their consequences are going to be tenfold, so much more difficult and harder than the flood. And so God is giving them an act of mercy right here. God is saying, because I don't want to inflict consequences on you that is far greater than the flood, I am going to intervene here and cut you off here. But how does God do that? Does God simply destroy the buildings? What does he do instead? How does God respond. Continue with me. Verse 7. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of the earth and left off the building of the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of the earth of all the earth. In other words, God does not do a short-term fix. God doesn't come down and destroy their buildings. God does a long-term fix, which is to confuse the way they understand each other. Now, let's be clear here. The Tower of Babel is not, it's not about the origin of languages or cultures. Okay, it's, that's not what it's not. It's not about that. But the Tower of Babel is about the origin of human disunity. 
Let me say that again. The Tower of Babel is not about the origin of languages or cultures, but it's about the origin of human disunity. Human disunity. Earlier, I was talking about how there's different stories in our society today, right? Asian American, Latino, Native American, African American, and the list goes on. But there's these different stories, and sometimes it feels like a lot of these stories are competing with one another. Sometimes it sounds like, hey, listen to our cries over here, we have the worst suffering. And then like, the next year, like, no, actually, listen to our cries over here, we have the worst suffering. Listen to our story, give us your support, give us your resources, so that we can fix this problem through our laws, so we can fix this problem through the education and all these things. So we, we see all these different stories right now echoing in our society. We have to stop and ask ourselves, what is that common thread? Especially if you truly believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, and you have a new life in Him, how are we as believers going to engage with people of so many different stories and backgrounds? After all, I can't relate to someone who has been systematically discriminated. I can't. And I can't relate with someone whose families have been separated by the government. I can't. I can't relate to that. And I'm not going to pretend like I can. However, there's something deeper here than the things we see on the surface. There's something a lot deeper here that we as humanity can relate to. Not just as black, white, Asian, Hispanic people. No, we as humanity can relate to. Because just like here in the Tower of Babel, when they were one, and they all could relate together, now we see that all of that has been destroyed and separated. In other words, the modern conception of race and ethnicity and culture today is a product of sin. Let me say that again. The modern conception of race, ethnicity, culture today is a product of sin. Humanity used to be one. They used to speak one language. They used to have one culture. They used to have one lifestyle. But because of our rebellion, because of our sin, because of our autonomous spirit, the Lord, from His mercy, divided us. Because we all know, we all have seen what humanity is capable of, the evilness that humanity is capable of when they're united. To mention a few, cultural revolution for one, in China, all of World War II, but specifically the Holocaust, all of the concentration camps in Russia as well, everything. Humanity is capable of so much evil. And this is just when one or two nations are together. You can't even imagine when the whole world is in on these projects. And so with that being said, this is an act of mercy. And so every time when you hear these stories, think about the Tower of Babel and think about it like this. Humanity is so divided by their languages, by their cultures, by their specific ethnic problems because of sin again and again. And I know, like I said before, we can't necessarily imagine how it feels like to be a different ethnicity here in America. We can't. And so the question remains, how can we still minister, still love and serve people of different backgrounds? How can we do that? What's the common thread? And I would say, one common thread we need to remember that all of humanity has in common is sin. You don't have to turn here with me, but I'm going to read from here. Romans 5.12 it says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all people, because all have sinned. I'll read that again. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death came through sin, therefore death spread to all humanity. Because all sin. In other words, if you really are interested and if you really look back into all of these ethnic specific stories, you're going to find 
so much dirt. You're going to find so much tragedy. So many of these different ethnic stories are intertwined. All their problems are interrelated. There's no way that the problem of, for example, Nazi Germany in the 40s, 30s, 20s, was not related with what happened in World War I, right? And all these other issues that happened. You see, and then you start creating these different groups of people saying that they have these specific problems. And then here's another example for you. There's no way that, for example, African Americans in this country, you look at their history in America, there's no way that that's not intertwined with everyone else and all the other countries that were involved with that type of crime. And so all that to say that sin also is the common thread between all these cultures. Even though sin, even though our cultures are a product of sin, sin, sin still runs, runs rampant in our cultures today. And it still binds us together. So interdependent. And so we can say that even though I can't relate to people on a level of their suffering or discrimination or injustice, I can relate to them on a level of sin. In terms of the struggle with sin. In terms of the temptations of sin in terms of the daily battle with sin, and also in terms of giving in to sin as well. But we know that as believers, through Christ, sin has been defeated. Sin has been dealt with. We know that already. And so the question remains for us believers, how do we live like that? How do we live a life that does show we are no longer bound, binded to sin? And I think the first thing, the very first thing we need to do is to truly know that Jesus Christ came not only to destroy sin and death, but to give all of us a new, a new Humanity. Right here, Ephesians 2 says, Ephesians 2, 14 through 16 says this, For he, Jesus himself, is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing the law of commands expressed in ordinances, that Jesus might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, therefore making peace. And that Jesus might reconcile us both in one body through the cross, thereby killing that hostility. In other words, brothers and sisters, we are no longer bounded by the divided humanity that was started at the Tower of Babel. We do not, no longer need to be divided by our ethnic-specific only stories that is interwoven with sin. We don't need to be binded by those things anymore. Now, don't get me wrong. Those differences are important. They are. Ethnicity, race, on all these different stories, they're very important. And we can learn a lot from all these different stories. But we need to remember to not get lost. To not get lost in the fine little brush strokes and the little details. We need to also remember to take a step back and breathe and look at the bigger picture as well. That Christ has already came and given us a new humanity. And what that means is that if, for example, the missions team that just came back from South Africa, from Mozambique, they have, when they, when they went over there, they've experienced truly the one new humanity. Because all of them in South Africa, Mozambique, we're all believers. And that one new humanity is only binding in Christ himself. And no matter where you go around the world, you're going to have that one new humanity. You're going to have that type of relationship with all believers around the world. That is the one new humanity that Christ has created in himself. And so, brothers and sisters, as you continue on with your day, with your life, wherever you go throughout the summer, and as you're continuously rubbing shoulders with different people from different backgrounds, keep in mind this. 
that every time ethnic specific differences are shown, be reminded of how sin has divided humanity. And at the same time, know and be reminded of how through Christ, sin was defeated and all of humanity has been made one into a new humanity. We're no longer divided by ethnic lines, no longer divided by these things anymore. Because as we know, again, as other brothers and sisters around the world will testify, that it is because of Christ that we can be one new humanity. And that one new humanity starts here, everyone, in the church. We need to start living out that one new humanity here and now. Last week, I was just talking about how men and women are, all, are constantly, especially in the mainstream, fighting against one another. That's a prime example. That In the new humanity, that type of fighting has been dealt with. It's over. It's no more. Therefore, we as the new humanity, local body of Christ, let us start to exercise that. Let us start to practice that one new humanity. Because it does start here. It does start now with us. And so for all of us here today, who have been shaped by our upbringing, shaped by different languages, shaped by different cultures, let us also keep in mind that there is a bigger picture here in how the Lord God has created one new humanity through Christ, binded us by the Holy Spirit together. And for yourself, as you go on today, ask yourself these questions. How can I, in my daily life, truly live into that, day, into that new humanity? No longer binded by the world's standards, no longer binded by the world's divisions, but truly only through the unity of Christ and what Christ has done on the cross. Starting with the church, in the church, first and foremost. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time to be able to expound your word. And Lord, we surrender this to you, knowing that it is difficult, Lord, to live in a world that's so divided by culture, by language, so divided by different values, so divided by different lifestyles. And Lord, many times we struggle, Lord, even amongst our own family, God, being more Eastern-minded or Western-minded, Lord, or both, or whatever the context is, Lord, it's a battle. But Holy Spirit, we ask that you will continue to humble us. You will continue to unite us. You will continue to challenge us to surrender and to live deeper and deeper into the new humanity that in and through you, Jesus, have already provided, have already created. We're no longer slaves to sin. We're no longer slaves to our ethnic-specific issues. That in you, Jesus, we are one. And that we can learn from each other's ethnic-specific issues. We can learn from each other's stories, Lord. That is not to say that our stories is the primary goal. So Lord, in all these things, Lord, we will not forget that every single time we think and we see about race and ethnicity and culture and languages, God, may we, may we be reminded that we are living in the now and not yet. We are living in the moments, Lord, where we are still waiting for you, Jesus, to come back to truly make, truly, experientially and holistically make humanity one. In yourself. But until then, we ask that your Holy Spirit will continue to encourage, continue to give us the motivation, Lord, to start practicing that now within the church. And as we practice that here in the church, we will overflow that to our every aspect of our life, into Germantown, every, into wherever we live, wherever we go to school, Lord, wherever we work. Amen. That people will see that we are a new humanity, no longer divided, but only united. Holy Spirit, we ask that you will speak clearly and mend any misunderstanding within all of our hearts about what this all means for our lives. In all this, we thank you, we praise you, we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.